You're listening to the Real Estate Entrepreneur Podcast with Terrence Murphy, where we cover sales, investing, and entrepreneurship with an emphasis on real estate. Each podcast, Terrence and his guests will bring you informative and inspiring information within the real estate industry. Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Entrepreneur, where we talk all things real estate, sales, investing, and entrepreneurship, and excited to uh, introduce my guest. Before we get into that, we got some really good topics to talk about. There's a lot happening in the real estate space, a lot happening with interest rates. And so this is going to be a really good conversation. Now, this season, we're focusing more on multifamily. So multifamily uh, syndicators, multifamily developers, lenders in a multifamily space. So I think this is a perfect time to have this conversation. But before I go any further, I want to introduce my guest today. Ben Fraser is the chief investment officer at Aspen Funds, merging analysis and client service. He excels in innovative investments and has an extensive experience in investment management. Ben is the co-host of the Invest Like a Billionaire podcast with his father and Aspen Funds co-founder Robert and co-founder Jim Afusio. Ben previously worked as a commercial lender and first business bank as a commercial credit underwriter for Cross First Bank. He also contributed to growing institutional managed accounts at Tortoise Capital Advisors. Ben holds an MBA from Azusa Pacific University and a Bachelor of Science in Finance from the University of Kansas, graduating magna cum laude. He's a valuable asset to the Aspen Fund's team ownership, repositioning, and management of apartment communities in U.S. markets of growth and stability. Let's welcome him to the show today. Thanks for having me on, Terrence. Man, I appreciate you being here. We're going to be talking about your Aspen's funds and some of the things you're doing, talking about your background in real estate. But before we do, I always start off with a quote. This one's short. It says, your mind is like a bank. What you deposit is what you can withdraw. Simple, easy. Guys, you got to make sure you are investing the right things in, into your space and into your world. But one of the things we got to pay more attention to is what we're intaking on social media, radio, TV podcasting, meditation, whatever. If you're religious, if you're getting in the word of God, whatever it is, make sure you're intaking the right things. And then the last thing I'll say is make sure you are around the right people because your crowd is um, going to really, your, your vibe attracts your tribe. So in one minute, two minutes short, uh, give us your history. How did you get to this point and how did you become a real estate entrepreneur? Well, I love that vibe is uh, attracts your tribe. I've never heard that before. I like it. Yeah, so my background uh, probably a little bit different than you know a lot of real estate syndicators or active real estate investors. So I went to went to college, got a finance degree, got an MBA, and uh, actually went into kind of corporate finance for a while, uh, helping kind of an asset manager grow their funds, working with institutional investors, and then shifted over into commercial banking. So I was a commercial banker, um, underwriter. And then a lender for several years, and really got to see under the hood of a lot of the most successful uh, clients of the bank. And so, one of the the great things about being an analyst and a lender is you get to get all the personal financial statements and tax returns <laughs> of all these borrowers. Right? Yep. And so, we got to do the full underwriting. But from my standpoint, as a young, you know, hungry uh, guy wanting to grow and learn, seeing what all these successful people were doing. And after many years of doing this, you know, the common denominators were either they were business owners or they had invested in a lot of real estate and likely both. And for me, it was kind of a pretty big light bulb moment that, you know, I want to get into the real estate space and, you know, do bigger deals because a lot of these individuals I was um, banking were, you know, bigger developers or investing in commercial real estate uh, or business owners. And so then shifted about six years ago into the private equity world. And just as, you know, syndications were becoming super, super popular. Um, started try, trying to raise capital, and uh, had no idea what I was doing. Uh, we started doing these like dinner events, trying to raise money for our funds, and just completely flopped. But uh, learned some things over over the past couple of years. Have since raised about 150 million dollars in uh, investor capital, all from kind of retail accredited investors. Um, and my role uh, now is chief investment officer. So I've kind of shifted from pure capital raising to kind of deal sourcing, deal structuring, and um, managing capital and asset flow. Congrats, bro. So I want to I want to stop there. First off, 150 million raised. Mm-hmm. How is that? Two years, three years, five years? That's five years. Five Congr- years. Congrats, bro. Let's talk about it. 
before we get into kind of the lessons that you learned when you first started raising capital, first started doing syndications, let's go back a little bit. You said you were an, an, an analyst for a bank and you're seeing tax returns, you're seeing financial statements. One of the things that I'm always trying to encourage everybody that listens to this podcast is you have to create multiple income streams. So I took kind of the old rich dad, poor dad model. You have to have a career and your money has to have a career. But a lot of times on social media, everybody's talking about credit and this hack with this credit card. And I'm like, who's talking about three year tax returns? Who's talking about financial statements? Who's talking about cash flow statements? All those things that you really need. Right. Because I always say, like, when you hear about Mark Zuckerberg or Warren Buffett or this developer, you don't hear about their credit score. You don't even hear about how much money they make. You hear about their net worth yeah. and their balance sheet. So talk about that real quick. What is a financial statement and what are you like as a new investor or someone looking to invest in real estate? What are kind of those three things the bank's looking for when you're underwriting us? Yeah, I mean, great, great question and great points. I think what was a big revelation for me and shift of mindset, you know, when I was getting my finance degree, you learn how to read financial statements. So the two most common are your balance sheet and your income statement. For me, the income statement was the one that made the most sense because it was how much revenue do you have? What's your expenses and how much are you pulling in every year? And from an individual standpoint, that's, you know, what's your adjusted gross income? What are your expenses? What's your tax bill? And that's reflected on the tax return. But what I ended up finding is a lot of these business owners and especially real estate investors, they were showing very little income on the tax <laughs> returns, right? I and, knew it uh, was coming. Yeah. And so people that understand that, that was really confusing to me because I'm like, why are we giving these guys $10 million loans? And they like had a negative million dollar loss last year, right? That just did not compute. So then it was that shift to understanding the balance sheet and how much more important that that is. And I think just as, you know, those that are in careers and just the, you know, traditional financial system teaches us to think about how much money do I make every year and how much can I take home? And that's, that's like, step 1.0. But if you're thinking like an ultra wealthy investor, if you're thinking like the uber successful, they're trying to minimize the amount of income that they're generating, right? At least on a tax basis and maximize their assets because banks look at assets. Banks want to lend against assets. Now they want income because income is their primary source of repayment, but they're also looking at uh, what's the collateral and what do I have to lend against? And that's probably the bigger, the bigger thing and the more important thing. And so this kind of shift to what I call a balance sheet mindset, which is not just maximizing your earnings, but maximizing your net worth, maximizing the assets that you can have ownership of, which can be a variety of things, right? It's not just real estate, but it can be, you know, stocks and bonds, it can be owning a business, it can be, you know, cryptocurrency if you're into that. And in building your net worth, and that creates more capacity for you to borrow more and creates, again, more capacity to buy more assets. So that was probably the biggest shift of mindset for me at learning uh, how they underwrite these deals. Well, because it's so counterintuitive from what we're taught in school and what you hear on TV or, and it's like when you become rich, right? Because I always say there's a difference between rich and wealthy. You have to change the mindset. And I think like Robert Kiyosaki said it best is growing up our, the way we were scored is our, you know, our grades, right. Or in sports, mm -hmm. or did you score this many touchdowns or this many points or this many home runs and in school, did you get all A's? But when you become an adult, you know, your, your scorecard or, or your grade sheet is your financial statement. And I think if we can get people to understand that, because everybody wants to talk about all the degrees they have and how much money they make. And we know people making millions of dollars and they have no assets, no income producing assets, no net worth, no anything. They make a lot of money, but they spend it. And so that's why we, man, when I'm a real estate entrepreneur, I'm pounding my real estate agents on the head. Okay, you sold 35 million last year and you made 1.5 million in GCI, but how many income producing assets do you have? What did you do with that? capital? Did you just go buy another Lamborghini or whatever and spend it all on Zillow ads, right? So I'm always pushing people on try to, trying to create this. So my question to you as a, a young underwriter, what would you say the percentage of assets to net worth that is a good balance? Is it like, hey, if I'm worth 100 million, I should have 50 million net worth? What's that ratio? Because that's something that a lot of people don't talk about either. Yeah, I mean that's, that's a great question. It, it's probably hard to say a you know general rule of thumb. You know, if you're in the kind of Dave Ramsey camp, you know the 
asset to debt ratio would be 100%, right? (laughs) And I I think it's, I I kind of view it as what is the stage of your career, right? Because when you add debt, you add risk. Yep. But if you do it smartly, and if you're using debt or leverage against appreciating assets or assets that are income producing, your risk is a lot less. So, you know, we can get the, the, the whole good debt versus bad debt argument. Um, I think people intuitively understand that. But, you know, I, I think it's really a personal preference. And for me, as someone who's younger and wanting to build my net worth, I'm okay taking a little bit more risk to continue to, to buy more assets, especially assets that I believe in, that I can control, and that I can appreciate and force appreciation in. Um, I'll do that all day long. You know, I did, did a lot more when interest rates were, you know, three and four percent, you know, less so now. But I, I think that that's a winning formula. I think a percentage, yeah, I think staying, I mean, let me think, think about mine or a couple of my partners. We're probably, I'd probably say 50% is probably a, yeah. An easy rule of thumb. Yeah, I think so. I think that to me should be once you start kind of getting over that, you start kind of getting out over your skis, especially. And like you said, appreciating assets versus income producing assets is very important. So now I wanted to just tackle that because I feel like that's a conversation you don't hear a lot about. It's nothing sexy about a financial statement, right? Or debt to income ratio or building a net worth. But once you start building and you're like, wow, my net worth went up this much without doing all the extra effort because those assets are creating that, you know, phantom income, which creates uh, value. So no, that's good. I think one of the kind of minor thing I always like to talk about, you know, with this balance sheet mindset, if you are taking the income you're earning, you're buying assets, especially ones that are appreciating over time or that you can, you know, force appreciation, whether that's through a business or through, you know, value add real estate project or whatever, you know, what I've found is I've studied a lot of ultra wealthy because uh, our podcast is called Invest Like a Billionaire. And so we're studying what are the ultra wealthy doing? A lot of them, you know, if they don't have active income, they are actually using their assets and they're, they're leveraging against their assets to have non-tax events, right? So part of the way that they can generate you know, zero income is through net losses and depreciation, all those kind of things. But also, they don't want to realize the gains, right? So as you're continuing to uh, accumulate assets, the beauty is you can tap into the equity of those assets through through leverage, and you can use a lot of different strategies there. So I think again, you know, shifting that balance sheet mindset, there's so much more possibilities that you can do to to create even more wealth with the assets you already have. No, I love it. I love it. I want to pivot, but first off. What's the name of the podcast? I want to give it a plug. And, um, and then av- as you give it a plug, what would you say in doing the podcast and the, so- the topic you just talked about, what are the top five things that the wealthy or the billionaires are doing to create wealth or to create asset protection or create tax strategies? What would you say? Hey, here's my top five, just kind of blanket stuff. But yeah, let's talk about the podcast real quick, man. Yeah, I appreciate that. So it's called Invest Like a Billionaire. Our kind of thesis is, you know, the ultra wealthy are investing differently than the average retail investor, right? And the biggest, the biggest difference, the number one thing I would say is alternative assets. Um, and so we focus primarily on real estate, but also on private equity and venture capital um, and hedge funds. Those are kind of, you know, the big, the big three or four. And generally, as as we've studied this, you know, uh, Yale Endowment is a great example of a pioneer in this space. There's Tiger Twenty One Global, which is a big group of ultra wealthy investors that publish their portfolio allocations quarterly. And you can see on average, at least 50% of net worths are not in stocks and bonds. In fact, usually about 25% um, are in stocks and bonds. Uh, And the rest is in alternative assets and usually a pretty big allocation to real estate and a pretty big allocation to private equity. If you think about the average kind of retail investor, we'll call them, say they got a million dollars, a couple million bucks, They've been in the traditional financial system. They've been told to just buy and hold mutual funds, you know, until they can retire at 63. And that's not how the ultra wealthy are investing, right? And so um, that that's kind of what our whole goal is, is educating around primarily the alternative investments that that these folks are using. No, I love it. So, you know, like you said, stocks and bonds, uh, real estate, private equity. Let's chat on that real quick. And then I want to pivot to what you really are here to talk about, which is some of your syndication stuff, some of your fun stuff. And then I also want to hit the bank 
kind of situation that we're in right now. So before we sure. pivot to that, private equity, right? What What is the difference? Now, obviously, I know these, but what is the difference between venture capital, private equity versus more established syndication type stuff? Or what would you say are the sectors in private equity that, you, that you're seeing with the kind of accredited investors, not the big hedge funds and endowments and uh, family offices, but more of the, like you said, commercial or consumer uh, accredited investors? Yeah, I, I think the word uh, private equity, it, it gets used interchangeably for a lot of different things. So it can be confusing to people. I, I think the simplest way that I think about it, private equity can include real estate, right? So we have private equity, real estate. But more commonly, it's, it's used to refer uh, to buying businesses a lot of times with debt. And a lot of the, the strategy, most common strategy is buying an existing mature business that's maybe underperforming, owned by mom and pop owner. You consolidate them, you kind of professionalize them, optimize them, and then sell them as a bigger package for a better equity multiple. So that's that's kind of the bread and butter private equity strategy. In a lot of ways, it's actually very similar to real estate um, in that it's priced off a multiple of net operating income. There's kind of value add strategies, like I kind of just mentioned, where you're going to buy underperforming businesses and then you're consolidating businesses in a certain industry and you create value by doing that when you create scale because you can sell it to kind of a bigger private equity firm. At a, at a bigger multiple and you can add some debt. So a lot of times you can, you can purchase these uh, businesses with debt. And so you can create kind of positive leverage and you can force appreciation through those optimizations and through increasing an OI. Um, so that's probably the most common venture capital is, is similar where you're investing in businesses, but a lot of times they're a much earlier stage. So private equity you know, bread and butter asset is a mature business. A lot of times, in a heavy manufacturing or kind of blue collar type business, whereas venture capital is usually more sexy, a little bit more high tech, a little bit earlier stage. You're kind of shooting for the moon. You hope you get a hundred x on one of the investments in the fund, and if all other fifty go to zero, you're okay with that because that one one did a hundred x. So, those are kind of the, the different the different strategies. And from an allocation standpoint. What was interesting in a lot of the research we've done is a lot of these ultra wealthy investors have as big an allocation in private equity, so traditional private equity, which is by mature businesses, as they do in real estate, which was really interesting. And personally, I've not invested a lot in private equity. I've actually done more in venture capital, but that's just risk tolerance and yeah. kind of the deal flow I have access to. I love it. I love it. Man, we got a lot in common, man, for sure. We've done a lot of venture capital, a lot of private equity stuff. Obviously, okay. the real estate businesses and development, and no, it's pretty cool. So let's pivot to syndication. Let's talk about that real quick. So you did the banking, and I, I know I spent a little more time on that, but I felt like there was a really good topic to, to, de- to delve into. So what happens after the banking career? You go and start raising capital. Did you go right into raising capital, or did you do some deals on your own first? I went right into raising capital and joined Aspen Funds. For, for me, it was, I had some friends that were doing smaller deals. You know, I'm, I'm pretty entrepreneurial, but I also know some of my skills are, I'm really good at scaling systems. And the idea of going from zero to one was a lot less exciting than going from one to, a, one to 10, yep. uh, to be honest. I think just my skill sets, that's what I kind of decided to focus on. And so I thought, hey, I can go do some small onesie, twosie deals and kind of build up the traditional kind of strategy that a lot of folks do, start with single family, go to duplexes, quads, and then small multifamily. I just wanted to go straight to do the big deals. And I knew I wanted to partner with more experienced team, some infrastructure, some track record, and be able to scale from there. And so that's what I chose to do. But it was a little bit of just thrown in the deep end. I had no idea what raising capital looked like and what was required to do that successfully. So I kind of came in in pretty much flopped my first year. I, I was like, this sucks. I'm the worst capital raiser ever. But I was kind of going about it all wrong. That's a whole other topic we can get into if we want. But but ultimately it was I was I was thinking too small. I was thinking in on, on a one-to-one basis. So I was trying to do all these like one-on-one meetings. And there, there's some you know value in doing that. But eventually 
you need to go one to many. You know, mm-hmm. on this podcast, I'm sure you've got a lot of you know tertiary value from doing it uh, in a lot of ways. But you need to you need to create audience. You need to build trust. Uh, you need to build credibility and being able to scale on a one to many is is a really really key thing to just continue to build your audience and your funnel and um, just deal flow. So that was kind of a big shift. And then yeah, first year I think I raised like eight million bucks. Second year is like twelve million, then twenty million, then I don't know thirty million, fifty million last year. We're shooting to raise ninety million this year. So continuing just to build that snowball and uh, and scale it up. Well, congrats on that, man. That's the one thing I hear about capital raising is it gets easier as long as you learn from those mistakes, you learn from the experience and you keep building on top of it. You know, it's a snowball for sure, man. So on my first deal that I did, which I just started doing capital raising, everything we've done for 18 years, real estate acquisitions and businesses, just been me and my wife. But I started raising two years ago and I raised five million bucks on our first deal and I had to do it in two weeks. Yes. And, and and after doing that, I thought that's what every deal was like. And it was just, man, it was, I was like, if this is what raising capital is about, I think I'm going to go back to just doing my own thing. Like, I'm not up for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I raised 5 million bucks in like two weeks, bro. And it was just like, man, it was tough. Um, I mean, that, that, that's a, uh, that's legit. That That's very difficult to do, especially starting from, from ground zero, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was tough. It was a grind, brother. So I was like, there's got to be a better way. But um, yeah, so now what are we focused on with the fund, right? Now you're a part of Aspen. You're at the, you know, the front of the line of the company. Where are you guys at on total assets? Is there a niche that you're focusing on? And then why did you focus on that niche? Yeah, so our approach is what we call macro-driven alternative investments. That's kind of our little you know, tagline. And the idea is we pay a lot of attention to economic tides. And a lot of people think you can't predict the future and they're right, but you can a lot of times predict the direction that things are going by understanding economic, you know, so fundamentals and the supply and demand and what we call tides. Because a lot of times the 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 tides take a long time to to happen. And Investments go in cycles. Every asset class goes in cycles. And so we decided just based on our skill set, based on how we wanted to deploy our own capital, to not go after a single asset, but to go after multiple asset classes and partner with kind of the best in class operators in those in those asset classes, and then bring kind of the professional due diligence, asset management, fund structuring, capital raising to those particular deals. And so uh, we've invested in multifamily, uh, industrial, uh, self storage, uh, retail, and uh, we're actually about to launch uh, an oil and gas fund, our our, uh, our third deal there in oil and gas. And so those are kind of our primary verticals right now that we're focused on. But for us, we're what I call asset class agnostic. We don't really have a dog in the fight for where we invest. We just want to find the best opportunities and really what I consider the best risk adjusted opportunities because. You know, every every deal I believe in every asset class needs to be normalized with the risk you're taking. And so our strategy, especially in multifamily, has shifted quite a bit over the past couple of years, especially the past year. I mean, how we're going about investing in multifamily and what types of deals we're looking for. Um, and it's, you know, more difficult to find those deals, but we think they're going to outperform going forward. And then we're really looking a lot at development. Uh, we think there's a, a very good case to be made for development right now. Uh, we're involved in several large developments, both in industrial and in multifamily. And then uh, kind of the non-real estate one, which is is unique, is oil and gas. We think there's a very, very big opportunity right now um, in oil and gas and uh, are putting together a large fund to go take out some middle market opportunities. Love it. So you guys are kind of doing like a thematic approach per fund, right? Hey, this fund's going to be industrial, right? So you know when you're investing up front, you're, indust- you're investing in an industrial f- industrial fund. And this one's self-storage. And do you guys put a cap on that? Like, let's say, hey, or do you d- base it on deals, right? Do you say, hey, we're going to go raise $50 million to go invest in, in self-storage. And then once we kind of backfill that, we're done. Now we move on to the next theme. Is that kind of what's your approach when you're setting up the funds? Because that's a question I get a lot. Yeah, so we actually have three different funds. Our legacy fund, and I didn't even talk about this. But this is where we started the business ten years ago. Was in distressed debt, so we have a, we have a debt fund, 
uh, mortgage notes. Um, that fund has been going on for 10 years. It's an evergreen fund. It continues to operate uh, very, very well. That one's our biggest fund. And then we do ongoing kind of an annual real estate fund. And that, to your point, is a thematic fund, but we actually invest in multiple asset classes in that fund. So we'll invest in industrial, multifamily, our two primary, and then uh, opportunistically in self-storage and retail. Um, so all of our real estate kind of gets gets grouped into that that fund, and we're kind of creating a nice allocation and mix between those asset classes. So you get a nice diversification across asset classes and, and deals. And then our our third fund is the oil and gas fund. So that's kind of how we we separate our three funds. Love it, love it. Oh, that's really good. Let's talk today's market. Right, interest rates are up at all time high. Obviously, it, you know a lot of the syndicators. We had floating debt, which I was telling people to get caps, get refinance, get locked in. I've been saying it for like two years, like like just drumming, like drumming it up. Like, guys, we got to lock in this debt. And, you know, when debt's down, it's great. We're floating it. We're making even more spread, more margin. So here we are. What are your thoughts on the market as we sit today, quarter two, quarter three of 2023 and interest rates? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts and very, very similar to you. I actually just did a podcast that was released a few weeks ago called, uh, Is There a Real Estate Syndication Bubble? And we kind of analyzed uh, an article that was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And you probably heard about this deal down in Houston, Texas, a yep. uh, syndicator that pretty inexperienced, just he raised a, a ton of money uh, as a very good salesman but had a very bad business plan, did not buy any rate caps, had all floating rate debt. He used bridge debt to purchase this, uh, these assets, it had no, no back-end team. It was just him. He ended up buying, I want to say, three or 4,000 units over the course of uh, a year or two. And uh, these assets you know, went downhill very, very quickly. And he's had, the bank just foreclosed, I think, on uh, 2,000 assets, uh, 2,000 units. And uh, it's going to be a complete investor wipe. And the thing I think is so interesting about that story is I think it's kind of an extreme case, but I, I do think as I've been in the space for now six years raising money, you know, it feels like we've been in a little bit of a syndicator bubble, right? Where everyone and, and their, you know, grandma and uncle decided they could raise money and, you know, do the syndication game. And in Everything just goes up, right? You do a value add strategy, you go buy a class C or B asset, and you just magically find value and you sell it a couple years later and you make 50% IRRs. The, the, the challenge is when the debt was, uh, the interest rates were so low and the leverage was so high, you could get very, very seemingly attractive financing from, from these bridge debt lenders, right? They would, they would fund you 80% of uh, the purchase price and then 100% of your renovations. And you know it's non-recourse debt a lot of times, and so a lot of these syndicators, hey, it makes a lot easier not to raise as much equity. Interest rates have been low for a long time; they're not going to go up ever, right? And so they went by interest rate caps. So I think, on top of the exuberance that that drove down cap rates, and especially multifamily, and I think Class C multifamily assets, the the kind of the ignorance of the capital structure, I think is going to cause a lot of heartburn. Because if you take a step back and look at real estate as a whole, and what is the best beneficiary of inflation, it's real estate, yep. right? Real estate probably most closely tracks inflation of any asset class. And so from a long, long-term perspective, I, I think infl- uh, inflation is going to do wonders for real estate. The challenge is a lot of these deals were done with poorly structured debt, High leverage, floating rate debt with short term maturities. And because of some of the turbulence we're seeing right now, rents are coming down a little bit, right? They had a recession. Uh, operating expenses are going through the roof as they're kind of a lagging uh, thing behind rents. And a lot of debt is maturing. So I think there is a report that came out a month or so ago Fitch, which is a large ratings agency, just said that 23%. Of all the CMBS loans that are uh, maturing this year, will not qualify for a refinance. Mm. And what that means is there's not enough net operating income, and or they're constrained by too high of leverage because the banks have come down on their leverage, and the debt service coverage requirements are forcing lenders to tighten up. 
So I think there's going to be a lot more deals like when I just mentioned the Houston deal that is going to hit the fan and I think going to create a lot of turmoil in the market. Now, I think there's a lot of capital out there ready to kind of pounce on these deals. So I don't I don't think there's going to be as deep of a recession as we saw in 08. I don't think real estate's going to take as long and as hard of a hit as it did in 08, uh, commercial real estate. But I think we're going to see some you know, prolonged challenges. My thesis is that interest rates are going to stay higher for longer. I've been saying that for over a year. I think the Fed is underplaying the stickiness challenge of uh, inflation, and they're, they've held firm to their target of, of 2%. That is going to be really hard to do. Um, and it's come down quite a bit, but I, I think we're going to see inflation be higher longer. And as a consequence, see interest rates higher longer, which is going to c- put continued pressure on, on the deals that exist currently. And then the secondary kind of issue from that is we're already seeing this as banks can't get the refinances uh, from their current portfolios, even if they're performing well, right? Even if the deal is it's going to be okay. It's going to make it through. Well, they can't do new loans, right? And I've I've talked with several bankers on some of the deals we're doing, and they're like, "Hey, our bank's in good 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 condition, uh, good shape financially, but we're taking a big time out on any new deals because we don't have the capital, and we're not getting the the capital churn that we normally expect." So, aside from the the turmoil that's coming and some of the bad deals that are going to blow up, I think banks in general. Have a hard time lending. I think it's going to tighten up even more. So, I think we're in for a little kind of buckle up. But I also think there's going to be a lot of opportunity um, over the next six to twelve months as some of these things kind of play out. But I think we're just very early in still. Yep. And I hate to say that because I I love for interest to come down, you know, next week. But I don't think it's the case. Yeah, I've been hearing in the commercial sector survive till twenty five for sure. So yeah, it's going to be tight. And I think where it's, it's different is, I mean, you've probably seen a couple of those movies, Hollywood ma- made movies about 08, like The Big Short and some of those movies like that. You know, it was a lot of individual buyers. It was people who had no balance sheets, no no income and getting zero zero percent down loans, floating rates. So, you know, they were upside down as soon as their appraisal value went down 10 percent. Right. But I think now, like you said, this guy, let's just talk about that real quick. The Houston deal. There's a line around the building of capital they can buy that like tomorrow. And so when we got flooded back on the market in 08 with residential homes, that's why it's foreclosures and short sales. And we didn't have enough. We didn't have we didn't have enough qualified buyers to take it down. But like last year for just for the residential market. 32% 32% or 33% of the houses purchased in Texas was private equity. So that's just the houses. So, man, we get into these commercial assets. I think mm-hmm. the, the, there's a lot of people keeping capital dry right now for these kind of opportunities. So I think that'll help us kind of bounce back faster. I 100% agree. I think you know, the first question a lot of people ask is, well, you know why? Why haven't cap rates reverted? Right? Why haven't prices come down a lot on commercial real estate? And one of it is, I, I think, private equity real estate, the private market, it's it's lagging, right? Because no one's transacting right now. No one wants to realize a loss, and everyone's kind of holding on. Yep. But I also think there's this other massive force of demand that was not there in 08. I mean, if you actually look at the the excess savings um, on consumers' balance sheets, it's at an all time high. Now, savings rate has kind of declined a little bit. So people kind of point out, oh my gosh, the consumer's in trouble. But if you look at absolute dollars relative to long-term averages, uh, a month or two ago, the, the number was over $4 trillion in excess savings above the long-term average. $4 trillion. Yeah. And that's just consumers. Mm-hmm. So there's a massive amount of capital and hungry capital that's looking for a deal, right? So I 100% agree. I think it's going to be some turmoil, but I think those deals are going to get get snagged up. And I think that's going to, I think it's going to be harder to find deals, but it's also not going to create a huge deep recession that takes, you know, a decade to get out of. Hopefully the the Fed doesn't jack something up. But I, I would I would largely agree with you on that. No, that's good, man. Well man, this has been great. I want to get to my final questions. I send a lot of questions and sometimes I just freestyle like I did today because I like really just talking shop. <laughs> so moonshot, right? That's one of the questions we ask is what is your moonshot? Like for you, what's one dream or goal 
that others think is impossible or crazy to achieve. And it can be personal. It can be professional. But like, what's your moonshot personal? Well, I, I probably a lot of moonshots as it relates to business. We're trying to 10 X in five years. So first five years, we 10 X next five years, we 10 X and we're looking to, to raise a billion dollars over the next five years. And so that's kind of the moonshot goal. And uh, just got a book. I haven't listened to the whole thing yet, but it's called 10X is Easier Than 2X. And I think just the, the, the mindset shift from trying to think incrementally to trying to think exponentially is actually easier. And uh, the payoff is obviously exponential versus incremental. And so that's kind of the business goal that we're, we're shooting for and on our way to do. And Hey, even in a down market and a challenging market, we're going to keep plugging away and, and raising, raising the money. Yeah, you got that, bro. And then I always have my guests on Real Estate Entrepreneur podcast to you know, recommend a book. And um, you did Raising Capital for Real Estate by Hunter Thompson. Is there a reason why? Kind of what, what did that book do for you? Yeah, I, I think I put that one in. That's one I just love coming back to. Um, I'm a big fan of Hunter Thompson and, uh, and enjoy his stuff. And for me, it was a very helpful playbook for anyone that wants to kind of get into the capital raising side of things of just step by step. Here's what you do. Here's how you do it. And he's had success doing it. And I've pretty much copied a lot of the things that he suggested and have been able to scale with that. Um, and then I, I would probably recommend the 10X is usually than 2X as well. Um, just if someone's looking for kind of a mindset shift, it's a Dan Sullivan. He's the one that wrote uh, Who Not How, which I know a lot of people like. And uh, this is his latest book that just came out a few weeks ago. All right. I'm going to look that up, man. All right, brother. Final thoughts. Where can people find you? And then what's your final thought for our listeners uh, on the Real Estate Entrepreneur Podcast? Yeah. So uh, if you like podcasts, we've got ours, Invest Like a Billionaire. Our uh, private equity firm is uh, Aspen Funds, so AspenFunds.us. And I think you know, final thought. You know, we were just at a conference the other week ago, and you know, it's all doom and gloom. The world's about to blow up. The dollar's about to crash, and the whole world's about to fall fall off a cliff. I just, I just don't believe that. I think there's opportunity. I have an abundance mindset, and I think as investors, as entrepreneurs, we need to look for the opportunity. Yeah, it's challenging right now. It might be challenging for the next year and a half, but that's when you know the best deals are made a lot of times. And um, I think right now we're, we're kind of putting on our you know Sparta gear and we're going to battle and we're, we're putting together the hard deals. We're doing the hard work. We're shifting our business plans. We're um, grinding and, and working harder because I think the effort that we put in now is going to have an exponential impact and payoff down the road. So. Don't buy into all, all the fear. I think uh, as humans, it's easy just to believe the fear and to get locked up. But I think push in now, learn now, do everything you can to get better. And it's going to pay off down the road. Man, I love it, man. It was great shop talk. And anything I can do personally to help you, we're, like I said, we're in a lot of spaces. Would love to talk to you about fun to fun, you know, what we're doing. We're co GP and some deals with, with the right people. Uh, would love to connect with you on that directly. But once again, thanks for being on the show. And um, yeah, maybe down the road, I'll jump on your podcast and talk about what I'm doing. And uh, yeah, man, really enjoyed this time with you, bro. So thanks again. Yeah, I would love that. Thanks so much, Terrence. Appreciate you having me on. Yes, sir. All right, guys, go follow the podcast. Go check it out. Leave us a rating as you leave ratings. That helps us get you know, better guests. And more than anything, Man, the following we've had, the amount of downloads we've had organically has just been been crazy. So we appreciate you guys and uh, we'll talk to you soon. 